Hello everyone. Let's get started. We will be discussing a few things about Keras and the agenda is going to be very simple and very high level. There are just four points to be discussed and given it is about the wrapper, there would be a lot of hands-on exercises and I have also included some nuances of data implementation or so the model implementation using Keras. So we will be discussing very highly what is Keras, how do you build models in Keras, understanding various features in Keras and use cases. And what I have done is I have created three use cases. One of the use cases we have already seen, there was convolution neural network we have discussed, but one bit which was missing from the earlier one, that when we discussed that, we only discussed from the perspective that how you train your model and how you make your model work as far as convolution neural network work. But basically, we didn't discuss in that detail that how do we prepare our images, what all things we can include in our images to make our model more robust. Like I talked about that you can distort the images a bit, you can flip the images and how do you do it? Last time I said it's very simple, but today I have included the codes for, for you with some of the examples. It's not the exhaustive list what all things you can do here with the images, but I have included a few so that you get a hint that how it's been done and how easy it is. And looking at the Keras documentation, you can include more things for improving a model further. One thing before I start discussing about Keras is it's a wrapper on top of TensorFlow. The Keras given a wrapper can work on top of TensorFlow, it can work top of Theano, it can work top of CNTK. So whatever module in terms of deep learning software you have installed, Keras will take the backend of it automatically and start working with that particular backend. So when you let's say my machine has got TensorFlow and when I install Keras, so when I run the code, it will give me an indication that it is running on top of TensorFlow. But suppose you have Theano as well as TensorFlow, then you need to explicitly change which backend you want to run. And when you install Keras, it will be saving a JSON file in your C drive or the documents folder. And in the JSON file, you need to go and explicitly mention that if you want to make sure that let's say TensorFlow should be default, so you can just specify in the JSON file, it's editable, and not a very complex exercise. If you face any difficulty, just go to the website and they have you know, support for all different type of operating systems. So Keras is just a wrapper and in a similar fashion, we'll be discussing a TF Learn, which is again a wrapper on top of a TensorFlow. So given this understanding, let's get started. Given that we'll be discussing wrapper, so I'll be going back to the architectures we have discussed. We have already seen that, or we have already discussed a bit that what Keras is. And so Keras is a wrapper on top of either TensorFlow, Theano, or CNTK. So some people don't know CNTK, it's Microsoft's deep learning architecture, deep learning library, cognitive toolkit, if I'm not mistaken. And it is also making some kind of noise now that CNTK would be a really good deep learning architecture. But to be, to be frank, I haven't used it and I haven't done any implementation. I have worked on Theano and I have worked on TensorFlow. In my opinion, TensorFlow is moving ahead of Theano from the point that you find a lot of functional help, like new functions coming up, for example, sequence to sequence. It took me some time to find out solutions in Theano, but TensorFlow, there is a lot of help available. But as far as computational times are concerned, it is fairly similar, not much of a differentiation. So why we use Keras? We have already used once when we discussed the CNN model. There are three main reasons. One is it helps you really easy and fast prototyping. And how does it do it? That lot of things which we need to explicitly specify in when you're writing a TensorFlow code, they are being defaulted in Keras and the lines are very, very simple to understand because they most of the things have been defaulted and some of the lines like session you need to start in, in TensorFlow and you need to initialize the variables which are required from writing your codes in TensorFlow. You don't have to do these things in Keras because these already things been specified when you start a model. So when you're writing lesser number of codes and you can already see that what you are doing in terms of writing sequential models. So it saves a lot of time in, times in terms of checking whether a particular model gonna work or not. 
how does it really work in practice? Some of you would be wondering that if I can do everything in Keras and lesser number of codes and cleaner codes and easy to understand, why do I need TensorFlow kind of implementation where I need to spend more time? So one reason is and how does it really work in practice is that when somebody comes to you with an idea and let's say a manager comes to you tomorrow and say that hey can you tell me whether we can create a sentiment model or a classification model for the emails we receive every month from our customers in terms of uh, on a daily basis you receive emails and can we classify those in some way that there can be better distribution of these emails among the agents because as of now what's happening is transfer rate is around 20% because mail comes to me and the one guy doesn't understand what is to be done then he transferred to the next one by consulting the manager that who is the SME for this problem so is it some way so let me say okay I think it is possible do one thing give me some two three thousand emails which have some category assigned whether it's let's say Mac or Windows kind of example I gave so he'll say okay I'll give you the data tomorrow and you get the data you have just two three thousand of emails and you create a very crude model and show it to him and say okay I think it is possible I'm not getting a great accuracy but we are getting 60 70 percent accuracy and which gives me an indication that probably we will be able to do it the way we want it for the larger data set so it's really good for prototyping because you can pull through these implementations very very quickly Second is that because it's less programmatically intensive in comparison to TensorFlow, people who don't come from programming background like me, I haven't done a lot of programming. I don't know C or C++. I learned Python through my working. So I always be looking for any implementation which is lesser line of code and Keras really wins there. These are some of the reasons somebody would like to use Keras. But the limitation is that some platforms, for example, you want to make an API or you want to make an app, mobile app, on which you need to deploy your model on Android application. Then in those cases, there may be difficulty that your platform may not be supporting Keras kind of model object. Then that will be a good idea and that's how normally being done is that once you have showcased that prototype or POC to your business and they say okay it makes sense let's do it in the bigger data so while what people do is then they start building same or similar model in TensorFlow and TensorFlow's acceptability across different platforms is very high so that's how it works you create prototype in Keras showcase it quickly and once your project is sold you come back to TensorFlow and start developing your model from scratch so that's how a typical model deployment work where Keras and TensorFlow both are involved. It support most of the architectures which we have discussed. So ANN, CNN, RNN, I'll be showing it. In fact, I have got use cases as I mentioned earlier. It also support combinations of these two models. And there is even higher type of complexity, though it will not be a place to discuss it. But I'll try to show you that different type. So sequential models we have already seen. There is one more type of models we can define in Keras, but all the important architectures, three MLP, CNN, and RNN, they are available and very neatly and cleanly we can write the codes with very less number of line of code and we can even combine uh, more than one models to make the predictions. And third and even the most important thing about Keras is that it can run on both CPU and GPU. So you don't have to do anything really complex to make your Keras models run on any one of the GPU systems. For example, if you have TensorFlow on your GCP or AWS, then you can easily use Keras and you don't have to require any additional complex requirements to run Keras there. So from that point of view, it's also very, very easy. So given this understanding that how Keras can be helpful, let's try and see what are the different sections in TensorFlow. There are two type of models which can be set in Keras. One is called sequential model and sequential models we have already seen where what we do is that we compile the model in sequence of layers. There is another type of functional composition. I'll come to it in a moment. Though as of now we don't have to go in details, then it would be helpful because there are some APIs involved in terms of functional compositions and you can call these APIs from Keras. First have a look on sequential models and we have discussed this already a bit that what sequential models are that you stack the layers one top of the other. So it is if you go to the Keras website, 
it says that sequential models are nothing but linear stack of layers and what does it really mean is that you take a input layer and you connect it to the hidden layer and when these weights which are coming from input to the first hidden layer being calculated and the node values being computed after our activation function this layer becomes input for my next layer and all we are doing is we are putting next layer on top of the other and your model is calculated so these kind of models and all the three models we have discussed the densely connected which is MLP the convolution layer a model which is again sequential model and RNN and again a sequential model because that's a directionality in these models that you start from input and you're making some predictions given the supervised learning nature of these models it is called sequential composition functional composition is another type of composition in Keras and it has been used for making more complex models and when I say complex I mean that suppose you need to bring inputs in between of your models let me go back and show you the intuition then I go to the website and show you what does it really mean what's really happening here that you have like say whatever number of features you have once you have started this model in sequential composition this is the only input which would be passed in the model and all the predictions would be made through your input features but imagine if you want some intervention let's say here that when you know some features have been learned and for some of you it may not be you know very intuitive but let's say you have created a model for sentiment analysis and all the information you are getting to say whether the sentiment is positive or negative is let's say the sentences people have written and from those you have created a model but let's say you want to intervene or you want to ingest some information about time of that email somewhere later in the stage of the model then whether it will be possible or not in sequential so answer is no because this is a structure we have already set but functional composition in Keras gave the liberty to data scientists that if you want to create a model in such a way that it calculates some part of it from the input we have given and later on you want to combine information like what time the email come in or which country it came from or which language it was in so if you want to bring in those kind of metadata informations then probably you can use functional APIs and there is very great explanation in Keras example this is the one let me there was one yeah so this is the example I was trying to quote how we can use and this is the same example I was giving that let's say you're doing the sentiment analysis using LSTM with embeddings in fact I'll be discussing embeddings today so what you can do is that here you start your model only with the information of texts of email or tweets or survey data whatever you have and once you have created one kind of architecture you can embed let's say we say auxiliary information but let's say this is time of tweet so you can input these two things and then your model can be made based on both the information points one from the text as well as the other information and this is very similar to what we have already seen in SPS as some of you have worked on SPS as modeler in terms of creating different nodes and people who have worked on node based model node based software they are very simple in point that they can this node imports the data then this nodes cleans the data this nodes is for creating the model and here I can also embed another feature into a model so this kind of architecture Keras provides where you can bring in information from other features after you have already started building a model with other information it can also provide you output in between without completing the model so that's the output only from LSTM and then you can combine the information from time and the text and then you can create another model based on the two information points and the process is slightly different that you need to train it but the concatenation is more of like ensembling which we have in other software so it works in a similar fashion that it can concatenate information from one stream of information or one stream of your model with other stream of information available we will be going through in details only from the point of view of uh, sequential models so these were the two kind of models but for now because we are just starting dense layer is basically fully connected layer and that's a layer for our multi-layered perceptron kind of architectures so those architectures are 
multi-layer perceptron architectures and this architecture is called a densely connected layer or dense layer in Keras. Recurrent neural network. Today we will see that how you can do the recurrent neural network using LSTM cells for similar work. Convolution neural network and pooling layer, we have seen that, but I'll show you some differentiation which can be brought about using the data augmentation. And I'll explain you what this really means, but we'll be discussing that how you can use Keras for kind of improving your model by playing with your training data. So these are four things which Keras is really helpful and we'll be trying to implement all of them in our discussion forward. So first one, let's understand what is regularization. Before we go to the regularization layer, first understand what is regularization. So some of us and all of us know by now that how do we know that how good a model is doing in terms of accuracy. So let's say we have got a logistic model and what we want is that let's say this is the data we have on two parameters. So let's say if I have data on two features, let's say X1 and X2, and these are the training examples I have got for classification or separating these two classes from one another from the process of learning based on these two features. One way is that it, we can fit a very simple model, let's say a logistic model, which is a linear classifier, and it sets up a line something like this. Though it's a rather good model, I don't want that good model. For an example, I want to keep a bit bad model. Let's say it fits this line. Then you would see that it's a very straight line and it's giving us some kind of misclassification that this point is misclassified. These dots are being misclassified and we call this a high bias problem because your model is not being able to classify the classes accurately and the hypothesis which has been set is fairly basic and there is a lot of misclassification in the model. And you will see the high bias problem in models, let's say training data set and test data set. And you will see in these kind of models, uh, typically output something like this, that your training accuracy is let's say 0.65, which is not very good. And your test accuracy is let's say around 63 times. But all I'm trying to say, the accuracy on training data will not be very good and obviously the testing would be even worse than that. Another type of example or another type of hypothesis, let's say you want got data on second order polynomials and you use those parameters to fit a line and suppose it let's say fit this kind of parabolic or a second order polynomial hypothesis, though it is not doing 100% correct classifications like this one is a misclassified, this dot is misclassified, but by and large it's doing its job and we call this type of fit just right, though it's not a great name, but that's how most of the text will call it. That is just right implementation. And typically the output would be something like this, that it's, you know, 90% accurate on training data set and somewhere very close, let's say 0.89 or 0.88% accuracy on test data set. This kind of output, when you see, it's a kind of indication that, okay, a model is doing good on training data set and as well as it's doing good on the test data set. And if you get into this kind of situation, probably you have done a great task and your model is really good. There can be one more way that you include a lot of, lot of higher order polynomials and your model can be something like it has fit a very convoluted line, something like this. It got blurred, but you got the intuition that it was a very, very fit line and a very high order polynomials could make this line changing that much. So it is doing 100% accurate or very, very high like this, though I'm mentioning, but it will not be most of the time 100%, but it is doing really high accuracy, let's say 0.8 or 0.9% of accuracy. But when I look at on test data set, your accuracy, let's say is 0.8 or 0.7. And this is the differentiation and this kind of chart is really helpful in seeing that how good or bad your model is doing. It has nothing to do with the architectures. It is just from your you know, model deployment perspective that how do you really understand that where you have reached. And this kind of problem is called high variance or it is also called overfitting. And why it is overfitting that it has fit too much or too cleanly on training data set and not doing the similar predictions or similar type of accuracy on testing. It is also called a generalization problem.
that your model is not generalizing well to the new data points because these points were available the training time and what your model has done is it has really really memorized your data and fit this line which is doing 100% or very very high accurate on the training data set but when you take it up on test which was not available at the time of training the line does not separate that better because now this is not generalizing well this kind of problem is called overfitting and to avoid overfitting there are some steps which we can take to make it just fit so if you have set up this kind of model we want to make sure that our model not only does a relatively good prediction on training but it also generalizes well on the test data set or the data which has not been seen or the new data set whatever you want to call whenever we reach into this particular situation you realize that we try increasing number of layers and nodes and making it more complex but imagine you have made it that complex that it has memorized the training data itself then you need to identify some ways that you know you kind of make it something like this so that it can do prediction better for training as well as for testing and these processes which does this task of you know making your model generalize well fall into the category of regularization there are a few ways of doing it but i'll be discussing a couple of those and remaining one are already there sometime they have been implemented in models let me tell you it's one of the most common thing when you will be doing a model actually deployment because as of now in last seven classes all we have seen is how do you fit the model we haven't gone into this area of fine tuning we have discussed some bits of you know how do you choose the values but we haven't touched this section and these are some tricks which would be really handy at the time when you will be developing your models so when you see overfitting problem in your model what are the ways you can avoid it or you can remove it one is i'll be talking about regularization techniques but first let's come to a problem or a solution called getting more data and how it can solve if you think intuitively that how it can really solve overfitting problem if i have more data as i said that you end up getting overfitting problem when your model has memorized the training data sets but if you increase the training data set let's say initially you are working only with 1000 training examples and let's say 500 each for two classes and when you fit a model it has memorized these 1000 points have seen that where they fall and because you have used lot of lot of nodes and features it has kind of identify where each data point lies and kind of tweak the line accordingly when you get more data now let's say you have 100000 data points it would be very difficult for your model to memorize every data point so this particular way whenever you see that model is doing some kind of overfitting issue just bring in more data set and it's a tried and tested thing that if your data is relatively new what i mean is that you should not just replicate these 1000 rows 100 times that's not the correct thing i said i said if you get more data from the same distribution or similar distribution it is tried and tested thing that your model would have some kind of correction or regularization because it will not be able to memorize the data set all of us know that getting new data is not always an easier task so there is a process called data augmentation and that's available in keras as well as tensorflow let's say you are working with images so data augmentation is the process of generating newer data from existing data so if you see is that this is a cat image which is available with us but if i can just take the mirror image if i say flip it then i have created a new image and some of you may argue that it's not a new image it's not you know capturing new features and you are absolutely correct augmented data may not give you as much freedom or as much removal of overfitting as a new data set will do but it adds some value so you have some images you just flip them you can do horizontal flip you can do vertical flip so let's say you have created it upside down or you can do zoom of some section of the image so let's say you have do zooming and zooming is a very very simple exercise in data augmentation in keras as well as tensorflow that you say that i want to zoom 20% of the images so that your images looks different so data augmentation can be one of the ways of dealing with overfitting another way which we have discussed briefly when we were discussing the neural network something called dropout and what does the dropout really mean 
it works from the intuition which I just said that let's not make your model memorize all the points. So how does it really work? Let me explain it. It's a very interesting point which have come from the deep learning point of view. And most of the time you'll be using the dropout layer one way or the other in all three architectures which we're going to discuss. And let's look at the intuition that how does it really work. If I have four input features and we have four hidden nodes in each one of these three layers and let's say this is H1, this is H2 and this is H3. How does dropout work? That it would be saying randomly switch off some of the nodes while training your model. And what does it really mean? That let's say I have created a probability which I'll be mentioning in my codes as well. Keep prob. And let's say I have created keep prob for all the three layers. You can have different keep probabilities for different layers. But for example, I'm just mentioning that for first two, two layers, we have probability of 0.5 and 0.5. And for third one, let's say I keep the key probability of 0.75. What it really do is, and as you know, that we run the model for a different number of epochs. And you will see how this epoch comes in picture. And let's say I'm running my model only for three epochs. And this is the model you have set up. You have set that run the model for three epochs. Because first time it's going to run for first epoch. So first epoch, randomly, let's say you toss a coin. And let's say for this node and this node, it was came that you need to switch off and rest of them, you keep it open. For second one, let's say it came for, because this is random process, these have been switched off. And because the key probability is 0.75, it means I need to keep 75% of my nodes open or keep them in the model. And one of them I need to switch off. Any one of them randomly, let's say this one, I have switched off. And basically when I say switch off, it means that I'm saying that the output of this particular node has been converted to zero. Now, if you see the output from the model, this particular node would be calculated based on these two nodes, these two nodes and these nodes and then the output will come and you will do some back propagation to learn these weights respectively and the prediction would be made in the first epoch. And the weights have been updated when we do this process. Then in the second step, when we run for the second epoch, again I check and this time let's say these two nodes get switched off, these two get switched off and let's say this one gets switched off and then the prediction has been made on the remaining open ones and then the prediction is made. And the third epoch I do the same random switching off the nodes and your model would be making predictions in each epoch. What it's really doing is it is forcing your model to not memorize that how much a particular node contribute and forcing it to make predictions only with the remaining nodes it works the same way we were okay with L1 and L2 regularization technique, but we can use those L1 and L2 regularizations here I mentioned briefly, but dropout is work really, really well and it's very easy to implement and we'll show you how it can work for solving the overfitting problem. The batch normalization. Normalization and batch normalization are the same from the point of view that how does this normalization happen? There would be a couple of things which are added from batch normalization side, but as far as how this process has been done is same in normalization as well as batch normalization. So first try and understand how does normalization really help. I have been kind of advocating that you should normalize your data. Either you scale the data on the same like between zero and one or you normalize the data with zero mean and one standard deviation and we have seen the formula for normalization and how it really helps. So one thing is that if I intuitively want to see, let's say this is the actual data which is on X1 and X2 and if you see here that the scale of both these values are different here that there is very less change in the value of X2. However, there's a huge variance in the values of X1. And imagine these would have been on different scales. Let's say this value is 1, 2, and 3, and these values is like 100, 200, and some bigger values. So what really happens if I have this kind of values? But when you remove mean from these values, they will be like origin and in between. And then what you do is you do the normalization by subtracting mean and stand dividing by standard deviation. And now your data is kind of randomized and it would be helping in terms of learning your model. 
and some of you may ask this question that you know why it really happens you know data is the same it was just you have done some kind of transformation how does it really help in terms of model training so let's have an intuition from a couple of graphs and see that how does it really help in making your model really fast so if you look at some of these graphs just look at the equation first this equation is the equation of your cost function and what it's saying is 1 by m summation of difference if you take this particular section as your cross entropy and it is calculating loss that what is the actual value and what is the predicted probability and basis that your cost has been computed and your objective or the process of optimization is that you need to find out ways of w and b or more if you have more parameters then in such a way that this loss has been minimized if you plot this data on three dimensions let's say we have w b and j and if you want to see that how these values are so if it's unnormalized data and i have w and b and j it will not be on the same scale and there may be values which are different and for understanding you can also think the same way that you have different scales for it was w2 and this is w1 and because both the features are on different scale you would have a different scales for this and your cost function would be more of convoluted it's like you know there would be different spaces in different directions and if i see the contour plots it will be kind of this elliptical shape and what will really happen when the training happens it will be changing a lot of values where the scale is high and lesser values in terms of horizontal direction because we need to change the smaller values because the scales are less and your model training really happens scales like this and reaches the minimum value when you kind of standardize your features in the model your cost function is more or less symmetrical and it is easier for your model to do the process that you start from anywhere and then you reaches the global minima so there was an intuition the same intuition has been applied in the nodes as well so now if i go back and show you once we have got this understanding that if my features are on the same scale it is easier for the model to kind of learn and converge better but now if you look at the architecture here the multi layered perceptron architecture the architecture that what really happens in these different layers h1 h2 and h3 that these input nodes are input to the first hidden layer and let's say you call them so what you really do is if this is w1 and this is w2 and this is w3 just for explanation you will be doing two things in this particular node first let me call it z and z as score and let me call it layer 1 i'll just to specify the top side is 1 this is layer 1 and bottom side is the node value so the value of the score which we have been calling score or output it would be w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus w3 x3 and in a similar fashion you can calculate z1 2 which would be this node and z13 which would be this node so once this has been calculated that would be some product of your weights and respective inputs this value for all three of them may be any value because these are different weights and these are inputs and these may not be scaled i have intentionally haven't talked about another step that once you have calculated the step the score here you apply an activation function on each node so let me call it a1 so it is the output of this particular node after i have applied an activation function g on this one and g can be anything either relu or sigmoid or tnh whatever activation function i wanted to use but these two values are being calculated on each node first you calculate the score and then you use the activation function to get the actual out and these values a1 or a12 a13 these would be on different scales and now whatever the values from here a11 a12 or a13 now these are inputs to my next layer now there is a possibility that these values may not be of same nature the way we got our inputs and we have seen what differences it brings to our model optimization when our inputs are normally distributed or normalized we have seen in the case of logistic regression where we just have weight multiplied by 
weights and doing some kind of prediction because these are my inputs and these are not normalized or normally distributed or not scaled on a zero or one if I'm not doing this standardization I would be facing the same problem if my inputs were not in a simpler network and what I meant is if you say x1 x2 and x3 let's say I had a very simple model like a perceptron and making the output and these were my weights and you recall this is a logistic model basically now because these nodes have become input and if these are not normalized or scaled I will be facing the same problem in terms of optimization so batch normalization is the process in which you normalize the values coming out of the node in each one of these layers so that when you feed the output from these nodes to the next layer all these values are normalized in a similar way we used for our input layers these are the functions I have already mentioned only one thing is left and I intentionally didn't talk about because as I said that I'll be talking about two high parameters or three new hyperparameters in the class so this bit we have discussed that how we can normalize our values but it was observed that you know normalizing the values to 0 and 1 does not always help but if you have these normalized values with some mean and some standard deviation which your model can learn in the process that was really helpful and how we can do it actually we can introduce two more hyperparameters which are trainable and you say that normalized value here it was like zero mean and one standard deviation but you can again do zi is again a normalized value improved one and you can do it with gamma hyperparameter multiplied by zero mean and one standard deviation normalized value and plus beta and these values would be learned in the learning process the same way we learned our weights in the same way we would be learning the values of gamma and we'll be initially starting it with some random value but in the process it will learn the same way as it learned for all other things like w and b or b1 w1 w2 and all and this function remains same and through the chain rule it will be learning but actually we don't have to remember this and I don't want to get into the application how does it run end of the day all you have to do is most of your applications in TensorFlow and Keras already takes care of this process so the normalized values in your nodes are basically not with zero mean and one standard deviation they are normalized with some mean and some standard deviation and that mean and standard deviation value would be identified through the learning process the same way your model learns w's and b's this is an example on churn here this is a data set about customer we have customer id we have last name and first name and we also have information that whether what was the credit score what is the geography what is the gender age and all other information about the customer and whether he exited or churned or not so that's the information we have and we want to create a model especially the MLP a multi-layered perceptron or artificial neural network architecture which can help me predict how we can say that which customer is going to churn or not in future so do you see that these two column geography and gender they are important and variable but these are in categorical values so what we do is through one hot encoding if you recall we can convert them to zero or one and most of them are binary so we can create just zero one and rest of the fields are numeric already so we don't have to worry about so our objective is take this data and try predicting whether somebody is going to churn or not and let's see before I do that you can easily pip install Keras if you don't have it in your system I have used in both Windows as well as Mac which I'm presenting here let me pop it up and it takes just a minute's time if you're using pip and if it doesn't work through pip you can install you go to web and install it from there from exe file if it doesn't work but in my case I have used it a lot of time and two three laptops have already installed and it worked every time pip is working import these three libraries numpy matplotlib and these are for data preparation this is the data I showed you that was in csv format so you can use pandas dot read csv x is 3 to 13 it means the first three columns if you recall were like customer ID and name so we don't require them so we are starting the input from fourth because the index is 0 fourth to 12th column we need X and the 13th column is our Y so we have created that now the X1 it means the second column was gender 
the location and the third feature was gender so we are using one hot encoding in terms of creating numerical representation of these values then splitting the data into train and test so 80 percent into train 20 percent into test we have been doing it then we do a standard scalar so converting all the values in our features of all features in x we are transforming them to all the values between zero and one so we are fitting transform on train and using the same process or same values for converting same for test there was the same process we have been using till now but now the second part is how do you make an artificial neural network so we need just two things one is we are building this from kera so we need to import keras then we are using sequential model because if you recall we are putting one layer on top of the other in the linear fashion and all these slides or all these layers are going to be of densely connected and mlp was all those layers were densely connected so i'm starting my classifier as sequential model I'm adding a dense layer. Unit six means that I'm initializing six hidden nodes in the layer. Kernel initializer that what kind of the connection bit between input layer and the hidden layer, how these weight needs to be initialized. So uniform is one, it can initialize weight between zero and one. You also had other methods like random n, which initialize weights with zero mean and one standard deviation we use truncated mean but all these processes are initializing our weights we are using relu activation function and this is the number of dimensions 11 so number of input features are 11 that's we are explicitly telling and if i just draw you a bit this is our input layer which have 11 nodes and we have our first hidden layer which have how many six nodes and we have initialized all these connections in between this using uniform distribution of weights and on top of each node in this layer we are using relu activation function then i'm adding another layer so after this i'm adding another layer of densely connected layer which have again six nodes weight i'm uniformly initializing then activation function relu and last an output layer what i'm doing is because it's just a binary classification i can use zero and one what is the probability of output so i'm adding one unit same weight and activation is sigmoid which gives me the probability of an event then once we have set up the architecture with two hidden layers and one output node we can compile the model so classifier.compile we are using optimizer adam we have loss as binary cross entropy and metric which we want to measure is accuracy between predicted and actual values so i have run it a very simple model classifier.fit x train y train batch size of 10 and epoch of 10 and gave me the output of 85 percent and if you need to predict for a new entry where i need to classify for x test i can do it using the predict function and we have also seen an example that where you have all these values like geography is france and gender is male credit score is 600 and all that information available you can create an array of these values and use same prediction function to see how good your model accuracy whether your model is predicting somebody the person is going to churn or not and that's how this kind of data is being used in crms in customer when you call a particular contact center your information would be available in the data set when you call your information would be evaluated against a trained model and your output would come whether you are going to churn or not here we have created the confusion metric so test and predicting this is true positive this is false this is true negative and these are false positive and false negative how i can use and how i can test a lot of values in one go itself and let my model tell that what is the best combination of different hyperparameters the hyperparameters you need to tune is that how much batch size you take how many epochs you run it for which optimizer you should use whether you use adam rms prop or gradient descent or how much learning rate you should use but value should be there so grid search is a method through which you can test multiple combinations that comes from scikit learn actually what it does it it just create different combinations so if this is two this is two and this is two how many combinations we have two 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 it means like eight combinations we can make and out of these eight combinations your model would be doing something like this that first it'll try 25 as batch one epoch and adam then it'll say 25 to rms prop 
25 to Adam. So all the possible combinations your model will try and keep on saving what was the accuracy it has got. And the easier way to do it that you define your artificial neural network as a function. So I have built a function built classifier and I'm giving optimizer as one of the input for my function and which I'll be deciding it later. And then once I have fit this models, these are the same codes. But all you are doing that you have built this code within a custom function, which is like build classifier, or you can give any name to it. Then you call this particular function Keras classifier and build function is the function you have built in here. And you create a dictionary of parameters. And I have tried it with very simple ones. The batch size is this, epochs are these, and optimizers are these two. You can try other things as well. Let's say you want to try different loss functions, cross entropy or MSC just giving you different options but as of now I have tried three parameters which you can choose as a data scientist and then run your code through grid search CV and call the classifier this is the classifier and the parameters is the dictionary of this and scoring is accuracy and CV 10 is cross validation 10 so there's like inbuilt cross validation and when you run this code what you'll be actually getting it will be running this function the build classifier for all the eight combinations and eight is like two 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 so two combinations from batch two from epoch and two from optimizer so eight combinations would be available it will be running for all of them and what I'm really saving is once you train on X train and Y train save the best parameters which gave me the best accuracy these two things I'm interested in so it will be running it for all the combinations. So it gave me the best parameters from these three combinations which I gave that one epoch with item optimizer with batch size of 25 is giving me the best accuracy of 79.6 for this particular model. Out of these combinations there was 25 1 and Adam is the best combination for this model. In a similar fashion you can try other hyperparameters of parameters which you want to try like instead of using uniform weight you want to try uniform random initialization and truncated normal kind of weight and then see which weight is really giving you better results but all I wanted to show you that you can run these combinations in one go it will be taking some time in fact I started with 20 and 30 but it took a lot of time and in fact crashed so I just used one epoch and two because it's only for illustration purpose. The example is that we have some cat and dog images and we want to classify into cat and dog given the images. We created the model through the sequential model because it's a sequential model like MLP. We start a convolution layer with 32 filters, 3 by 3 matrix. Input shape is this. It's a colored image of 64 by 64, applying ReLU and then doing max pooling of 2 by 2 matrix and added another convolution and max pooling layer. After that did the flattening and final hidden layer is a densely connected layer with 128 units and the last is a binary classification. I'm using one dense layer with sigmoid activation and compiling with Adam and binary cross entropy. The important thing I wanted to discuss because data augmentation is not only good for you know, creating kind of complex data set but it really help your model that in future it would be able to even do correct predictions for images which are not very clear. So let's say you click a picture of a dog and his face is only half is there. It's very zoomed in picture or there's some noise or the picture quality is not very good. If you have trained your model on a very neat and clean pictures, there is a possibility that your model may not do justice or may not do correct classification. So what we normally do to overcome such issues that even there's some issues with the images or there's some kind of distortions or noise in the data even in that case your model will be doing correct predictions. So for that we have something called image generation and that comes under image data generator section of Keras pre-processing image section and it has lot of lot of values which you need to play with I am just playing with one two three three values but there are let me show you what all things you can do with image so you can take all the images image data generator and what you can do is you can read what all things it does it can normalize the values it can rotate the values so rotate the images by some degree and zoom the image by some values clean shift image so but these are like all these things 
image augmentation perspective we can do. What I have currently used is you know, zooming and sharing the images so it kind of distorts the images. Horizontal flip, you know, kind of the, the change which we did for a cat image. So you flip the image. So 20% of the images you zoom, 20% of the images you shear, and rescale means you convert all the pixel values from 0 to 1. And we do it only on training data set so that once your model is trained even on distorted and very convoluted pictures, it has got real good power than just the clean pictures. On test data set, we normally don't do such operations. We just want to make sure that model is doing good stuff on these changes on the training data set. And once it's been done, we just try to see on just scaled pictures and see how good it is working on the train test images. And why we do it? Because when we're doing it for the you know, new image, we may not want to do all these things because we are doing it, the shearing and zooming only on 20%. Not all the images have been zoomed in. But there are a lot of, lot of options. And I would encourage if you can go and read what all these things are doing, especially if you want to develop a very robust image classifier, especially you want to make sure that it works in all conditions, all lighting conditions, whether you know half of the face is there or half body is there of the animal and your model will still be working. So some of these functions would be really helpful for creating a robust model. But this particular section with a lot of features can really enhance the capacity and the power of your model in terms of better predictions. Let's move on to the last implementation here. So what we have done is we have implemented a use case for sentiment analysis. So we have done an implementation using RNNs, recurrent neural networks, with LSTM cells. So first you import the layers, the data set, IMDB is movie database, which have reviews of movies, and it has review whether it's a good movie, somebody you know, liked the movie or not, what was the sentiment about the movie. Sequential model, we have been using it, density connected layer for the MLP architecture, LSTM is for LSTM, embeddings for embedding and pre-processing. Thank you so much. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning!